Hi, I'm Mike O'Hara. Welcome to my YouTube channel. Now, in December of last year, a couple of months ago, I decided that I wanted to make a New Year's resolution of creating and uh, putting out a new YouTube video every week for the whole of the year. A um, couple of reasons for this. Uh, the main one being that I want to grow my YouTube channel. I want to grow the number of sub subscribers I've got, um, grow my audience. And most of the YouTubers I follow uh, have said that... Uh, one of the best ways of growing an audience is to put out content on a regular basis, uh, make it quality content, and uh, then things should should start to happen. So <laughs> I guess time will tell. It's now mid-February and uh, my subscriber numbers have gone up a little bit, but uh, there's a long way to go yet. Um, but anyway, I'm sticking at it and um, I've now put out 10 videos um, some of which are original compositions, some of which are arrangements of tracks that I like, and uh, and it's going well. And I've got myself into a, a I think a fairly steady flow of uh, being able to put out uh, a video every week. So a couple of people who watch the videos have said it'd be really nice if I did a kind of behind the scenes feature of how I create one of my tracks. Um, so that's what I'm doing now. So in this video, I'm going to show you the whole process of how I did my latest track, Cygnus, which the the details of you can find in the link below somewhere. But before I do that, I just want to uh, give you a quick run through of my setup. Uh, I'm here in my home studio uh, where I've got a bunch of different guitars. There's a Yamaha nylon string, a uh, custom telly, which was rebuilt by a very good friend of mine, Giles, who is also an excellent musician and someone who I'm hoping to collaborate with on a, a one or more future tracks. My Fender Japanese Stratocaster, mid-1980s. Solid guitar, very versatile. Uh, my Fender Precision Bass, good solid bass. And a lovely Ibanez hollow body uh, electric, which have got flat wound strings on uh, to give it a nice jazzy tone. I've also got a fairly bog standard acoustic. This is a Shaftesbury acoustic with a Fishman pickup on it uh, that picked up for about 250 quid. Um, I've got my Cajon, which is a very versatile box uh, that I use for making beats. Um, and it doesn't sound that great by itself, but it's really good for putting a rhythm down and then layering that. Uh, on the technology side, um, I've got my iMac running the latest version of Logic, whatever it is, 10.5, 1, 10.6, whatever. I can never remember these things. I've got this Novation Launchpad Mini, which I don't tend to use so much, to be honest, because it's. Um, I didn't realise when I bought it, it was my own mistake, I didn't realise that the, uh, the pads aren't uh, velocity sensitive, so I can't really play it uh, with much expression. Uh, but it is handy for, for tapping out beats. Got my Korg Nano Control 2, which uh, one of my boys got me for Christmas, and an M Audio Keystation uh, Mini 32 keyboard, which is great for doing lead lines and things on. I've also got my main master keyboard, which is a uh, Roland A33 uh, MIDI keyboard. Fully weighted keys, and uh, this is about 25 years old. Um, but again, really solid piece of kit. Now, normally, if I'm starting a, a new composition, I'll generally either start with uh, improvising something on the piano or on the acoustic guitar, and more often than not, it's the acoustic guitar. But for some tracks, and, and this is, is one of them, uh, I'll start with uh, a bit of improvisation on the piano. And I'll just record straight into Logic using the grand piano, uh, one of the grand pia piano presets, uh, with maybe a little bit of reverb on it. And, uh, yeah, just play and see what comes out. And typically, I might be playing for you know, 10 minutes or so, and then I'll go through and uh, pick out what I consider to be the best bits and, and fix any mistakes that I've made. So what we're looking at here, this is the or original recording I did into Logic. As you can see, it's a MIDI track, and uh, the original recording sounded like this. So yeah, it's just me kind of noodling around on the piano, as I say, for about 10 minutes or so, and um, and capturing that. So my first step is just to go through this recording and uh, fix any obvious mistakes in the uh, on, on the piano roll, uh, of which there are many, because as I say, I'm a bit of a shonky uh, piano player. Uh, and, and I'll also maybe tweak the velocities a little bit in case I've kind of played anything too loud or, or not um, not loudly enough. Um, just so it's it's a, a cleaner uh, recording. 
I'll also fix any any obvious timing errors. So sometimes when I play the piano, I really don't know know where to go next. So I might kind of pause for a few seconds while I kind of figure out what the next bit should be. Um, and those pauses don't sound great in the, the finished piece. So I'll go through the MIDI track and get rid of those pauses so the timing is a bit tighter. The next step is uh, I always prefer working with audio than with MIDI. I mean, MIDI for me is great, you know, when I want to fix errors, you know, if there are certain notes that I've played wrong or, or timing inconsistencies. But once I've done that, I much prefer to work with audio. So the first thing I'd do is bounce this down to an audio track. So here's the audio track. Now, when I played this, I wasn't using a click. Uh, there is no tempo information on this at all. So the next step is to apply some tempo information and uh, and to tempo map this audio file. Now, Logic has got some pretty clever tools for uh, for tempo mapping, um, but to be honest, I actually prefer to do it myself. I, I, I find I have a lot more control if I just go through the track, listening to it, and try and map out uh, where the tempo changes are. It's more long-winded, it takes more time, but it gives me more flexibility. So I'll just tap out the rhythm, here we go. Okay, so two bars there, so that means that bar three should be falling around here. So I will adjust the tempo of the of bar one until that's about right. Now, obviously, this isn't exact because even within those two bars, my tempo is fluctuating quite a lot but at least it gives me, for the first couple of bars, what the tempo is. And then I'll just do that every couple of bars throughout the piece. And then bar five, so bar three, I'll just add a tempo, go to bar five, and adjust that until it lines up. And I'll keep doing this as I go through the track. Um, like I say, it's fairly long-winded, takes a bit of, bit of time, but at least it gives me a tempo map that I can work with. So now I've created all of my tempo markings, and uh, you see these lines here that, um, uh, that show where they are. And the great thing about that is it's taken what I've played freely on the piano and it's put it on the grid. Um, so if I want to, I can use Logic's very powerful flex time uh, time manipulation tools to move stuff around uh, on, on the grid. It makes it very easy for me to build on. Um, with drums, bass, other instruments and so on, and I can cut and paste and chop things up and move them around and everything will stay on the grid. So the next thing I do now that I've got a piano track that I'm happy with is I want to split it up into sections. And the reason I do that is because I, I don't want the, the, the piece of music to be static. I want it to flow and to go through a bit of a kind of evolution uh, as it progresses. So I want to have different instrumentation, different things happening d during different parts of the track. So you can see here I've created some markers to map out different sections of the track. The A section is this, and then the B section now it goes on to the C section. So in each of those sections, I want to have different things happening with the, uh, the other instruments that I bring in. Um, so that's why I create those markers. Once I know what those sections are, I'll start bringing in other instruments. And typically, if I've started on the piano, then my next instrument will be the acoustic guitar. If I've started on the acoustic guitar, next instrument will be the, the piano or maybe a, a different acoustic guitar. But I always try to, to bring in another instrument that will complement what I've done and maybe build on the, the harmonic structure that I've created. Um, so for this track, I decided to bring, on, bring in my nylon string guitar next. So here's the, here's the nylon guitar part that, uh, that I came up with, uh, and you'll see that uh, I wanted to have an intro with the nylon string guitar before the piano came in, so I created a couple of uh, additional markers for that. So if I just loop this section, for example. That's the intro to the track, and then the piano comes in. Thank you. 
And when I'm creating my new guitar part, I'll typically just listen to a section at a time and come up with something for that section. So for example, for this F section here. So I'll just play through the piano section, you know, have that on loop and uh, be improvising on the, uh, the guitar until I come up with something I'm happy with and then I'll record that. And then, so generally I'd record each section on the acoustic guitar separately and then glue it all together uh, once I'm happy with what I've recorded. The next step typically is to record the bass uh, and that's what I did on, on this track was uh, uh, after I'd got the piano and the nylon guitar down, so the two main kind of melodic and harmonic um, uh, instruments, um, I wanted to uh, to ground that with the bass. So I came up with a bass line and uh, this is what it sounds like. And in context with the other instruments. Again, I'm not a great bass player, so I tend to keep my bass parts uh, fairly simple. So now I've got my bass, I've got my piano, I've got my guitar. Um, they're the, the foundations of the track. Um, the, 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 the final kind of um, important uh, foundation to put down is the drums. Now there's various different methods uh, that I'll use when I'm recording drums. The ideal, obviously, is to have a real drummer. Unfortunately, I've got my boy Finn, who is an excellent drummer, and he's played drums on a couple of my tracks. Uh, you'll see him on Elements Part 1 and on Polarities, if you check those out on my channel. Um, but he's not always available, and um, recording remotely and collaborating remotely can be a bit of a pain and is, is somewhat time-consuming. Um, so... Um, I use him where I can, but where I can't, um, then I have to do it myself. Um, and one of the ways uh, which I've done on a lot of my tracks is to use my cajon, which is this box that I told you about, where I just record the rhythm that I want to play on the cajon and then uh, layer that uh, recording with uh, sample drum sounds. Didn't do that on this track, so I'm not going to go into too much detail on uh, on that uh, for this walkthrough, but I probably will uh, in a future video. What I did here was actually use Logic's drummer. Now, Logic comes with a very um, comprehensive uh, virtual drummer where you can choose from a range of different styles, a range of different kits, and it uses artificial intelligence to uh, to come up with grooves and beats and so on to match what you've um what you've written um and it doesn't always come up with what you expect but what it does come up with sometimes is really good and that's what i used on on this track so here are the drum tracks i created uh, based on uh, logic's drummer now the nice thing about the logic's drummer is that um once it's come up with its its patterns um you can convert those patterns to MIDI and obviously manipulate the, um, the, the individual notes and beats and hits and so on. Um, and you can convert, uh, convert it all into audio as well. And as I mentioned, I'd much prefer to work with audio. So what I've done is this is the MIDI track that was created from the drummer. Um, and these are the audio tracks that I bounced down from that MIDI track. So if we just solo the, uh, the drums, you can hear how they sound. Okay, so now the, the piece is starting to take shape. I've got drums, I've got bass, uh, I've got my original piano and uh, the nylon guitar. And I also felt the track needed a bit more in the way of harmonic interest. So I, I added a, uh, um, a, a Rhodes uh, style piano, which is one of the, the Logic plugins. And uh, this is what that sounds like. Very nice and twinkly. So I've got the the the, the kind of harmonic and rhythmic structure of the piece. What I then want to do is to add uh, a melody on the top. And for this track, I decided to do that on electric guitar. So I used my Strat um, and my Ibanez and my Telecaster for uh, for this. And you can see there are different uh, different guitar parts using different settings. 
in each of the different sections of the song. So in the B section I've got this going on. And in the C section. And so on and so forth. So different sounds used uh, for the different guitars in different sections and some of these I've doubled up with a, a harmony guitar so for example in the B2 section I've got both my Strat and my Ibanez uh, which have doubled up left and right so I've got the Strat down the middle and the Ibanez, uh, two channels of the Ibanez left and right. Just listen to that in context of the whole track. So the Strat is the main uh, lead instrument here, being backed up by the Ibanez in a couple of sections and the Tele in a couple of other sections. Then I've got all my synths and um, samples and, uh, and bits and bobs that I'm using down here. Um, what I do with, with, with these things is just to try and, 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 and flesh out sections um, to bring in more harmonic uh, interest. I do this with, by playing some synth lines, um, but also by bringing in samples. And I use the, uh, the Cymatics uh, sample pack for this because they've got some really nice kind of sample stems where you can bring in multiple instruments in a, a specific key or a specific tempo um, and bring those into your track. So, so for example in this pack if we just solo this again not doing a whole lot but when you hear it in context So in terms of instrumentation, uh, that's pretty much it. Um, I like to keep everything colour coordinated um, so I know where I am. It makes it a lot easier to follow and I tend to group things as well. So for example, wherever, wherever I've got multiple kind of instances of uh, similar instruments, um, I will group those into track stacks in Logic. So then just makes it easier to see what I've got. So for example, I've got the drums track stack, the nylon guitar, which is doubled up in parts, the strats, uh, the Ibanez left and right, telly left and right, uh, the synths and the percussion. And it just makes it easier to manage the project. Okay, so now I've got the, uh, the arrangement of the piece sorted. I've got all the instruments recorded, uh, everything's in place. Uh, so now it's time for mixing. So here's the final arrangement and the mixer. It's about 48 channels in all. Um, so first of all, let's look at gain staging. Now, for me, it's really important to get a clean mix, not to have any individual channel too loud. So the first thing I always do is to make sure that no individual channel is peaking uh, above around 12 dB. Um, I do that by uh, putting either a gain or a limiter on each of the channels and setting the gain level to make sure that nothing is, is peaking uh, beyond that level. Now, some people might think 12 dB is quite low, but you know when you're using um, modern uh, digital audio workstations, digital recording, um, that there's so little noise that you can have uh, things peaking at minus 12 dB, which gives you a lot of headroom to, uh, to to play with when you're summing everything together for the for the final mix. As for panning and positioning in the stereo field. Um, I've recently started mixing using the LCR technique, which stands for left, centre, right. And what that means is everything, every instrument is panned either dead centre, fully over to the left or fully over to the right. Um, now, this is, is a, a technique that was used a lot in the 60s and the 70s uh, when, you know, mixing desks didn't offer uh, the range of functionality that they do now. But a lot of modern producers use this technique as well, and I find it gives a very spacious and, and wide um, and clear 
uh, sound. So I've been using it for my recent tracks. Doesn't mean I'm always going to stick with it, but for now, uh, I really like uh, really like the uh, the results it gives. So every instrument, I decide whether it's going to be a focus instrument, so whether it's sitting in the centre or whether it's going to be a kind of supporting instrument, which means it's either going to be left or right. And I try and balance everything in the left and the right speaker so that nothing's standing out too much. Uh, and that gives me a nice wide mix, but with a focus on the uh, the melodic instruments and the, the, the bass, the fundamental sounds uh, in the centre. Uh, so you can see, if you look at my pan settings, they're all, apart from... The hi hats, for example, which are usually panned a little over to the uh, to one side or the other, everything is either dead centre, uh, left or right. So I'll, I'll listen to the mix a few times and just play with the faders uh, until I've got a you know a fairly decent sounding mix, not using any plugins at all. So the next thing I do is to apply an EQ to each track and to cut frequencies that aren't needed typically at the low end sometimes at the high end but um, without doing that there'd be a lot of kind of low end information that can really muddy up the mix so i just you know really chop for example you know if i'm looking at the uh the the roads for example uh you can see i'm chopping everything below 264 hertz and i've also got a uh, a low shelf uh, cut uh, at around 585. So if I just play that section. So it's very subtle um, and I've also applied a slight boost here at around two and a half uh, uh, kilohertz. Um, but it just means that there's low end information can take up a lot of space in a mix. And if you don't get rid of it, it can really make things sound muddy. So I'll go through you know, every track um, that, uh, that doesn't need that low end information. I'll just get rid of it completely. Um, now, at this stage, I'm not really boosting EQ apart from very, very slight um, uh, lifts uh, and wide using, using a wide cue. Um, but... Uh, I always prefer to cut frequencies rather than boost them, just to give a more natural sound. The next thing I apply is compression, and again, I tend to use compressors on pretty much every track. I'm mostly using the standard Logic compressor. Uh, it comes with a range of different um, emulation uh, models. The one I like and tend to use a lot is the um, the Studio FET, which is modelled on a 1176 compressor. It gives a nice punchy sound to uh, to whatever instrument you're working with, but I also do tend to use the um, the Studio VCA uh, for drums and the Vintage VCA um, for um, if 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 I want a smoother type of compression. Typically, at this stage when I'm compressing, I'm looking to reduce uh, about three dB, um, three or four dB max. If something needs a, a heavier compression, I'll apply that. Other than for like kick and snare, which sometimes I quite heavily compress, um, I'm not really applying too much in the way of compression, but I am applying it to, to everything, but with different settings. The next step is to, uh, to apply delays and modulations and that kind of thing. And that very much depends on what, it, what effect it is I'm trying to, uh, trying to get. So I use the standard Logic um, delay plugins a lot. I also use the Sound Toys Echo Boy. And if I want something really kind of um, spacey, uh, I'll use the, uh, the crystallizer. So, for example, on electric guitar number three here. You see that crystallizer brings in all these nice little twinkles and so on, which I really like. Um, so I'll do my, send, my insert effects first, and then the um, the send effects I use are generally just um, uh, reverbs uh, more than anything else. Maybe a delay uh, here and there as well. So the two reverb effects I've got here are the Valhalla Supermassive, which is a free plugin, and as you can see, the preset I generally use is Cygnus X1, and that's why I call this track Cygnus because I love 
this preset so much that I use it on pretty much everything. And um, I've, I also use the Valhalla Vintage Verb, which uh, is a paid for plugin, uh, but it's got some really nice ambiences and um, uh, some nice emulations of, of, of rooms and plates and things. So that's my mixing workflow, gain staging, positioning in the stereo field, uh, EQ, compression, um, insert effects, and then send effects. The final step I go through when I'm mixing is uh, applying the, uh, the necessary effects to the master bus. Now, typically I'll just use three effects on the master bus, uh, a compressor, uh, a gain and uh, a limiter, and I'll also have a meter to uh, just to tell me that uh, what my LUFS uh, is, which is a, a an industry standard um, uh, measure of loudness. Now, if you're releasing music online on on YouTube or Spotify or Apple Music or you know any of these other online platforms, generally you don't want your integrated LUFS to go above minus fourteen dB. If it does go above there then they will reduce uh, the volume of your track to bring it down below or, or to a level of minus 14 dB. So uh, the important thing is, is to make your track as loud as possible, but without going above that minus 14 dB. Otherwise, you will lose volume um, when, uh, when they publish it on their platforms. Um, so this meter will tell you what your integrated LUFS is. So if I just play a section of the track, You can see with the mix that I've got at the moment, I'm running at about uh, minus 19. Now, I want to bring that up to minus 14 dB um, so that it's as loud as it possibly can be without the um, the online platforms reducing the sound. Um, so, uh, first of all, I'll uh, slap on this limiter as the final plugin in the chain. Uh, with an output setting of minus 0.3, that just makes sure that nothing is, is clipping. Um, and clipping can sound horrible. Um, then I want to bring up my uh, my gain. Now I'm running currently at around 19.6, minus 19.6, so I can add 5.6 and that'll take me to, uh, to 14. And that gives me some more volume. So you can see I'm now running closer to minus 40. The other thing I like to do on the master bus is uh, run some parallel compression. Now, this generally, uh, parallel compression just can kind of fill out a track some more. It'll give it, you know, a bit more body and a bit more weight. Um, so generally I'm running a ratio, a compression ratio of about two to one uh, with a, a mix of 50%. So not applying 100% compression, I'm just applying 50%, so it's, it's, it's parallel, basically. I've got the, the uncompressed track and the compressed track 50-50. Um, and that should give me about 1 dB or so of gain reduction. And the Vintage VCA compressor is the one that I really like using for this. It gives it a nice, nice warmth. So that's how I create a track. So thanks for watching and thanks uh, for sticking with this video to the end. I know it's been a fairly long one. Uh, if you do like these videos, then please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Uh, as I mentioned at the start, I'm trying to grow my subscribers. And uh, if you want to, uh, to check out the Cygnus video, then the link is in the description below. Cheers.